Number 12. Three Cosmic Messages, Second Quarter, 2023. Daniel Duda. Lesson 12, The Seal of God and the Mark of the Beast, Part 2, in the Three Cosmic Messages. Dr. Daniel Duda is going to be our moderator. Iris is going to offer our opening prayer. Our loving God, we give you praise. We give you praise for the privilege it is to learn and to study about you and to allow that truth about you to sink deeply into our hearts and minds. I pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit as we open your word, as we discern, as we wrestle with the text and with your truth. May this truth set us free, lead and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Daniel, do we need the book of Revelation? Can't we just remove it from the Bible and do just fine? We who sit in this room have our, in a way, Bible scholars. We've had John Pauline. We've had Daniel Duda. We've had guest speakers. But a lot of the people who read the Bible, who study the Bible, have one-tenth of the knowledge that we have here in this room. And I'm just wondering... Do I really need chapter 13 of Revelation? No wonder people stumble. And I use that word deliberately. They stumble when they come to Revelation. And they say, what in the world? Who wrote this book? And for what purpose? You know the joke about Albert Einstein and his driver. His driver was taking him to give the presentation on the theory of relativity. And then after a while, the driver says to him, This is no big deal. I could tell that lesson. Let's test it next time. I will come and present the lecture on theory of relativity. And so he did, because he heard it so many times that he did well. And then the first question comes from the audience, and he looks and says, oh, this is such an easy question that I will ask my driver to answer that. (laughs) So it's such an easy question that I will ask my professor to answer that. Well, I'll give you two reasons, Alyssa. For one reason, I think Revelation is essential for Seventh-day Adventists. Because if we didn't have Revelation, we wouldn't know about the cosmic conflict. And the cosmic conflict is kind of critical as the unifying story behind the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the Bible. But not only that, if we didn't have Revelation, the Christian world would not have the cosmic conflict and origin one of the earliest church fathers responding to a pagan philosopher articulated the cosmic conflict as clearly as any of us have ever understood it. And he was responding to a pagan philosopher only 50 years after Revelation who was mocking the whole idea. So evidently the earliest church was deeply invested in what the book of Revelation taught about the cosmic conflict. So the entire church, not just Seventh-day Adventists, are indebted to the book of Revelation for this cosmic view of the character of God. And without that, I think we would have enough to be saved. Our understanding might be limited. Unfortunately, many people take some of the details of Revelation and create fantastic theologies that confuse everything. Well, now that you say that, John, I'm thinking back to a long time ago when I first met Danny, and we were getting better acquainted, and I was not a Seventh-day Adventist, and she wasn't Japanese either. Well, she had a couple of strikes against her. (laughs) But as I gradually learned more about Adventism, and as Danny kept talking to me about the great controversy and the cosmic conflict, I started realizing that Because of that framework, Danny knew so much, and he could put everything he was learning within this framework of the cosmic conflict. I still can't do that, but I understand now why you're saying how essential it is to Seventh-day Adventists, and evidently at some time in the world, it was essential to other theologians, other deep thinkers, right? John Pauline has a book called The Deep Things of... God? Yeah, it's worth reading. And then I'm going to make another plug. Daniel Duda has a series on the cross, and at Easter time, you ought to listen to that. Okay, Bob. Do any of the Revelation experts in our group here have an opinion as to whether John, who wrote Revelation, understood what he was writing? 
In other words, did he have a better understanding, say, than we would have? Or would he say, I'm going to transmit what I have been shown, but I probably don't really understand it either? The book of Daniel is clear that Daniel did not understand many things. Revelation, in contrast, says that these things were written to understand. He said, how does it go in chapter 1, verse 3, where it says that take these words and hear them. And that word hearing, there's two different constructions in the Greek. One is to hear but not understand, and the other is to hear and understand. Revelation uses the latter. So the purpose of the book was to be understood right from the beginning. And based on origin, it sounds like they got it. They got the central message because the pagans were disturbed by this cosmic conflict idea. So the essential message of Revelation was intended to be understood right from the beginning. And that's different from the book of Daniel. Did John understand everything? Probably not, because in chapter 19, he bowed down to an angel and got scolded for that. So John was not perfect in knowledge either. But the intention of the book was to be understood and to speak to the original situation. We sometimes forget that. Revelation was designed for 95, not 1995. We can gain much from it today, but missing that original message might cost us a lot. Horrible analogy, but has anybody ever tried to put a nail in with the back of a screwdriver? Because you didn't have a screwdriver? You can do it. It doesn't work well. But just imagine you have a tool chest, and it has a screwdriver and a hammer. And all you generally need to do is put nails in. At some point, you might say to yourself, you know what? What do I need the screwdriver for? Because a hammer does it so much better. And I think with Revelation, if you misuse it, if you use it for the wrong things, It's no different than using the back. You might get something out of it, but it's not near as good. And I think that the question about, do we really need the book of Revelation? Not if it's going to be misused, but for what it's meant for, yes, we do. You can use a screwdriver and the hammer to get the nail sub-flush. There must be a theological angle to that. All right. Yeah, my apologies that we theologians made it so difficult or that it appears rather confusing than helpful. On the other hand, there is an obsession of human mind, just give me the distilled version and don't bother me with uh, anything else and all the side things. You can't even understand the Gospel of Matthew unless you have the Old Testament. So there is always a possibility that the broader your understanding, the more complex or more thorough will be your commitment to what God wants from you. And... In that sense, it's helpful. Can it be abused? Was it abused throughout the history? Of course. But if it's really unveiling of Jesus Christ, and as we are in the third angel's message, it warns you ahead of the deception that is going to come on the world in such power that the whole world is deceived. You certainly don't want to be on the side of those just because somebody didn't warn me. Back to Livius. And it's amazing for me, why do we need the book of Revelation? But it's amazing to me that these writings have survived up until today. What's also, and it speaks on its own, is how interconnected everything is, how everything is related and the stories and the themes blend and merge and lift each other up and just the holistic, I don't have words to describe it properly, but it just never ceases to amaze me how well it just flows and the Bible interprets itself is an unbelievable statement. And that in itself is a God thing, I think. Yeah, Revelation is about 400 allusions, quotations, and So don't start with the book of Revelation, but it can be incredibly helpful. Let's go back to the third angel's message. The memory text is the same as the previous one from chapter 7. So there is a process of sealing that is taking place. God wants to seal those who are on his side, while on the other hand, there is a false trinity that is at work. Sunday lesson starts with a deadly wound, chapter 13, verse 3. One of its heads seemed to have received a death blow, but its mortal wound had been healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. And let's read 5-6. Why is this important? Why the dragon is using the mortal wound as a tool of communication, a tool of persuasion? Why is it so? Revelation 5-6. 
Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the context is John who is crying because he doesn't know what the scroll contains under the seals. But then he learns there is a revealer who is going to unveil this. And when he watches, he discovers that the revealer is actually the tool of revelation. And the lamb was killed by violence. And now he's on the throne and receives the homage and worship. So obviously came back to life. Can you see the connection between what the beast does? Can you see the connection not only with the wound, but that it's healed? The time period in 13.5, three and a half years, 13.5. The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Which, by the way, 42 months is exactly as the two witnesses are able to exercise their witnessing on God's behalf. So can you see that everything that the beast does is parodying the ministry of Jesus? In the mouth speaking great things, in Matthew every time, Jesus finishes his sermon. There's a verse which says, And when Jesus finished speaking these words, the crowds were amazed because nobody spoke like that. He had the mouth that spoke amazing things. What does the beast do? He has the mouth that speaks blasphemous things. And you have it also in 16, 6. And what is the final outcome? Back in chapter 13, verse 7, what is the final outcome of the beast? Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. Have you heard about every tribe, language, and nation? That's the first angel's message. Because the beast has authority over every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. And once again, four means everybody. The good news of eternal gospel must go to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. Everybody needs to hear that. But once again, was given the power. Given by whom? The dragon, and ultimately, by God, who needs to allow these things to happen. Why? When we pray, we pray, be with us. Don't allow this to happen in my life. But repeatedly in Revelation says, and it was given the opportunity to fight against the saints of Most High and to prevail and to harm them. So ultimately, God needs to give the devil, here is the planet, prove your point, Revelation 12. And that includes that Satan needs to have the capacity to deceive. And those who don't want to stand on God's side need to have the capacity to stand on the side of the enemy. So what does it tell you about how the devil works and how God works? Would you rather live in North Korea, where you have only state television and one perspective on events? Or would you want to choose between a variety of news agents who bring perspective to you? Or do you only watch one source of information? I will never forget in 1986 when the Chernobyl power point blew up. Voice of America was conducting interviews at the train station in Kiev. And the reporter asked, So, the Soviet propaganda says there is no radiation in the atmosphere. Do you believe that? And the man said, they have been lying to us for 70 years. Why would I think that now they are telling us the truth? I still remember that interview. What is the lesson? How does Satan work? How does God work? Henry. This reminds about the pre of the, the knowledge of grand evil. That was the same opportunity that was given to Satan. He needs to have a place to present his case. So there is freedom. And the other one doesn't allow you to have that freedom. He will impose with authority, well, fake authority, because the real authority is the one that is not imposed. So makes me think about at the beginning in this earth and at the end in this earth, God is allowing the same principle. You have a place to present your case. Do we like it or do we want the children in kindergarten story? Now, there is an age bracket when you need to protect people from information that is harmful and hurtful to them. But the time comes when you need to release them and give them opportunity to choose. And yes, before the quarter is over, we need to go to the Garden of Eden, and we need to go even back to the rebellion in heaven, because the angels have to choose between two options. The morning star of Isaiah 14 and the morning star of Revelation 22. When you come to the garden, you have to choose between one tree 
and the other tree, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in Revelation 14, 13 and 14, you have to choose between two types of worship because the conflict is about worship. That's very clear. And on what basis do you make your choice? Mark Finley tells the famous story, a man being upset about the lady who sells the ice cream. Why do you have only vanilla ice cream? And the lady says, Sir, if you knew how much time people need to choose between two options, you would not offer more than one either. <laughs> Livius. I love what Henry brought up about the garden and the tree. And it never ceases to amaze me how God gives everyone freedom. All of his creatures get freedom. But there's also a protection, too. There's a restriction on the harm that can be done, as we see in the garden. And then even here, at the end of time, you said that the gospel must go out to all the world. In Revelation chapter 7, like at the tree, God is holding back the four winds. But he also has protection for his people in that he has 144,000, not literally maybe, but... Not maybe, for sure. He has his people prepared. And I don't know, I just realized this, but this is here, the 144,000, the 12,000 from all these tribes. Really, this is the gospel going to the whole world. Because how were the tribes situated around the sanctuary? They were all on four sides. So even though that four angels are holding back the four winds, on four corners, God also has his people on four corners ready to whoever is listening to choose, choose the sides. And remember, there is this pattern. I heard the voice and then I turned around to see who was talking to me. There is Jesus. I heard the voice of the sealed. It's 100. Then I turned around to see, and it was a multitude that nobody could number. Another amazing thing here is, is that there's 8 billion people in the world today. Contrast this with 144,000 people that speak for God. I mean, that is a super small number. You learn that from the opening of Revelation. I'm not saying it's literal, the 144,000, but, you know, it's contrast, yeah. The angels say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So the three is connected with God. Four is connected with this earth. Guess how many times the word Arnion, the lamb, is mentioned in the book of Revelation? 28 times. Seven times four. Perfect savior for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You can read in Revelation 4. From the th verse 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, three things. Why? Because the throne of God. Verse 8, there are four living creatures representing all living creatures. And they cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks, three things, to him who is seated on the throne, the 24 elders fall down. And they say, verse 11, Worthy are you, Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. How many things? Three things ascribed to God. And then in chapter 5, verse 9, the redeemed are singing the new song, Worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, nation. There you have it. Everybody, universal salvation. And they say, verse 12, with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Seven. Okay? Perfect redemption. So you can see how the numbers work in the book of Revelation. And this I heard and I saw pattern is very clear. Done. I think part of the difficulty in making some of these concepts practical is that the language is rather archaic. And I've been recently reading some stuff, and they talk about worldview. And the analogy I think that's really good is that some people say it's the glasses through which you see the world. And it seems to me that if Christ was maybe talking to us today, he might say, choose this worldview. And that there are two major worldviews that are in contrast. One is with power and might and coercion. And the other one is with freedom, kindness, with humility, and relationships, and that's important. And I think that the reason why it says to give glory to him is that he demonstrated that and showed us what it really was all about. 
in really practical terms in a way that had never been done before and is the example for us. And so I think the right worldview or the right lens through which we can see this will make it naturally for us to be grateful for what he's done and for the clarity with which he's given us a picture. And so in many ways, I think the idea of worldview sort of makes it maybe more current as far as what John is trying to communicate to us. He's saying there's two worldviews, and you've got to choose which one. And they're so different, the two worldviews. And I'm grateful that God's demonstrated one worldview that is so contrary to what I think has always been the, the more common worldview throughout all of history. Let's go to Second Thessalonians 2, starting from verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? And you know what is now restraining him, so that he may be revealed when his time comes. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but only until the one who now restrains it is removed. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will destroy with the breath of his mouth, annihilating him by the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is apparent in the working of Satan, who uses all power, signs, lying wonders, and every kind of wicked deception for those who are perishing. And why are they perishing? Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion, leading them to believe what is false so that all who have not believed the truth but took pleasure in unrighteousness will be condemned. Mm -hmm. So Paul says, already in his time, when I was with you, I told you these things. There are deceptions in the world. Something is holding it back. But God cannot prolong this indefinitely. And then the one who is holding it back is going to be withdrawn. The one who now restrains will be taken out of the way. And then the parousia comes. Before the parousia of Jesus is the parousia of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And the result is that the whole world is deceived. What does it tell you about the way how Satan works and how God works? If you want to understand the third angel's message, why is this background important? And verse 11, because they refuse to love the truth. The deception is irresistible. Any comments on that? What does it tell you, Elisa? Well, isn't that what's happening right now? Listen to those news stations. What is the truth? It's really hard to ferret that out, I think. They're talking about truth and untruth, and it's just hard to figure out which one should I believe. It seems to me that's happening in abundance today. Yes, and part of propaganda is that nobody can know what is the truth, and then you believe all kind of nonsense. Yeah, and Second Thessalonians 2 supports revelation in the sense of the truth being the issue and the unwillingness to tell the truth being part of the lawless one. I just want to point out one thing in the translation that says they refuse to love the truth. And that kind of sounds legalistic. Well, it's those who refuse to love the truth. Those are the bad guys. And those who decide to love the truth are the good guys. The text actually says they refused to receive the love of the truth. Like faith, love of the truth is a gift of God. And all we can do is allow the physician to heal. All we can do is to allow God to give what he's willing to give, but we often resist. And so I think that little twist makes it more of a gospel text. Yeah. Yeah, and it's in line with the first angel's message. Admit there is authority, there is a source of knowledge bigger than your little head. Because if you are the measure of everything, you are not going to receive something in humility that is greater beyond you if you are the measure of everything. Henry? Thank you. On the other hand, I think that we are tempted to put too much emphasis on knowledge. And when we define truth, we start thinking about the truth about this, the truth about that, as 
Iris mentioned in one of our prior sessions, the truth has a name, and that's Jesus. And that's the only truth that counts. I can be wrong in other things, and that is not going to be a problem. And that may be one of the reasons why the book of Revelation leads us sometimes is so difficult and makes people stumble because, and this may sound like heresy, but we Adventists try to put too much emphasis on so many little details that are not the important part of the book, of the Revelation. What Jesus showed John to tell us, I was discussing with a group of friends, we were finishing the study about the 66 books yesterday with uh, Revelation. And I said, I think that the problem that we have is that today, I still don't know how to use the emojis effectively. I make so many mistakes. Sometimes I use ones that are absolutely wrong, but I misunderstood them. And that's because I see youngsters not having any problem. They just look at them and they know exactly what that means. And my children, they need to correct me and say, hey, don't use that again. Be careful with that. And I think that's exactly the problem because now when John was writing this, he was using the emojis that were understandable for them. And then we are making a whole different story. So again, this love, as John was mentioning, they refuse to receive the love of the truth. They refuse to receive the love of Jesus. And that is the touching stone, in my opinion. Thank you. Mary Jo? I think that there's a possibility that we can love the Lord very, very much and still be deceived. I think that even in very devout circles, there can be misunderstandings that are held very dear that can sidetrack people. And Satan can use those intentionally to sidetrack people. And I think that God put us into groups, family groups. A group like this is very healthy too, because in this kind of circle, the emojis get translated or challenged. I appreciate what happened earlier in our previous session where a term was challenged, its use of it was challenged, and a more appropriate understanding of that term was brought to light. And I think that that is, in fact... The question in number two is ask at the very end, what can one do to avoid being swept away by this deception? It's in discussion. It's in community where we keep talking about things together. I have in my own family, my husband's side of the family, there's some people that are very entrenched in their beliefs and they're very godly people and they're very sincere, but because they hold their view so tightly and they refuse to be in discussion, they're going away that in my opinion, is not biblical, but they can't see it because their understanding of something is so held tight by them. So I think that part of the issue is a lack of remaining in discussion that allows for Satan to get us on side tracks, even if we are very sincere and love Jesus very dearly. Yeah. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer from Life Together, as soon as you are converted, God sends you to a community of believers. Why? Because you have a definite understanding how God works based on your life. And you are going to impose it on everybody else. But God quickly shatters all that dreams by sending you to the community of believers so that you go through a disappointment with yourself, with other Christians, so that you learn to appreciate that God works in a different way than just the way he works in your life. I think I heard it at Andrews from John Pauline the first time that two blind men meet that Jesus healed, and one says to the other, let's share experiences, so tell me what happened to you. And he says, oh, Jesus just said a word, and I saw everything. And the other says, no, 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 it didn't happen like that. Jesus put his finger on my eyes, and I still could not see clearly. I just saw people like walking trees, and then he did it for the second time. And he says, no, 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 he didn't do it like that. And they are arguing and fighting till today, because everyone has their own version of truth. And the third one, he said, go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. You see, even Jesus healed blind men in at least three different ways. And that's why the role of the community is so important. 
and both as Westerners, as Protestants, as Adventists, this individualistic approach to religion, me and my sweet Jesus, it's killing us ultimately. Because once again, there is no other authority, back to the first angel's message, than me and my understanding. And as we will say in the next lesson, when people study this, it will be a few months after the 30th anniversary of David Koresh. You cannot overemphasize the role of the community as a corrective, where you get challenged and submit your opinion to the fellow believers and pilgrims, because God leads a community, not individuals. To use the words of Ellen White, some people are advancing so fast that even angels cannot keep up with them. Julie? I want to say something in favor of details in the context of truth, although I appreciate very much what you had to say. Here's an example of details. Sometimes details are very important when we come to truth, and it's not just knowledge. So I'm going to give an example from my work. I see a patient, they come in, they have a problem. There's a chief complaint, we call it a little thing that they come in with, whatever it is they have a need for. And we sit down and sometimes I think, oh, wow, this is going to be really quick. It never is, especially with me. I ask a question and then they tell me some details and they tell me lots of details and I ask more questions. And sometimes they think I'm asking too many questions about details. But by the time we're done, I find out very often, not always, but very often what they thought they were coming in for is not the real problem or what they thought they were coming in for, they didn't tell me until the end of the visit. And because I looked at the details and I threw out a whole bunch of details and listened and put them together, something came out of that. Now, I think it's more than just knowledge. I'm learning about the person. I'm getting a feeling of how they talk to me. I'm getting a feeling of their heart, of where they're coming from in this conversation. So it goes much deeper than just the details of knowledge. It's also a detail of the heart. But in the long run, if I miss one or two of those little details somewhere, it could seriously affect that patient's health. For example, one time I had a patient that had a high potassium and we were trying to figure out which medication could have caused this and why did that happen. And somewhere in the conversation, something came up. This is on the islands. I was in Guam. And something came up about drinking coconut water. And I'm like, ah, there's your problem. You drink coconut water has a very high level of potassium. And we solved the problem just because of a little detail. So, and sometimes I think the details and the study is extremely appropriate, but also listening to the heart in seeking truth. And it is hard. I think without the community around us, we aren't going to get all the details and we aren't going to get all the perspectives that show the heart. We might miss something. And I think the nice thing about that is we have time. God gives us time, which is very different than the devil's method of force. And you do what I say right now. God gives us lots of evidence and lots of time to sort out those things so that those details come together and we can have that love of the truth. Excellent. Thank you. Let's go to Revelation 17, 14. What is the result when people refuse to accept, to receive the love for truth or the love of truth? Revelation 17, let's read 13 and 14. These are united in yielding their power and authority to the beast. Okay, so they come to an agreement, the unity for which Christ prayed for, that they all think alike. And the result is, verse 14, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. Once again, they are called and chosen and faithful, three things, because they are connected with God. Okay, Everything that's connected with God goes in threes. So do you see what's happening? And the result of the deception is that they even make war with the Lamb, who was killed by violence. Do you see the foolishness? And they think they can win. And the third angel's message is a warning. If you go in this direction, it's going to have tragic consequences. Don't do that. And by the way, you will have a checkpoint Charlie in Revelation 20 from verse 7. It happens for the second time. There's no help for these people. Revelation 20 from verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Can't help them because once again they come to life. What do they do? They continue with what they did there in Revelation 13, 17, before they were destroyed by the glory of the second coming. Attacking, being deceived, using violence 
there are more of us outside of New Jerusalem than them. Let's attack. There is no help for these people. All right, let's go to the mark and the seal. Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 31. So, everybody knows the traditional Adventist understanding of the third angel's message. So, God has a seal. And if God has a seal, you can imagine that the Satan who works with imitation is going to have an imitation of the seal, which is a mark. Okay? What are they? Or how does it work? John 19, verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. So if you look at Revelation, in Revelation 7.3, our memory text, do not hurt the earth or the sea or the trees until we have finished sealing the servants of God with a seal on their forehead. And in Revelation 13, you learn that the beast has a mark that goes either on the forehead or the right hand. So if God does something, the enemy will come up with his alternative. In Revelation 14.1, you heard that with him were 144,000, having his name and the name of the Father on their forehead. So the mark is connected with the name. And in Revelation 13.17, it says no one was able to buy or sell except those who have the mark which is to say the name of the beast and the number of the name. Once again, the mark is connected with the name, with the character. So it represents something. As far as the seal of God is concerned, it protects, while the third angel's message is a warning. If you have the mark, it's not going to protect you. On the contrary, you are a marked person. God's seal is the result of the receiving the love of truth, while the mark is coercive. And he forces everyone to receive the mark. So we just read from John. And people say, let's make sure that the dead bodies are not there on the cross. Because an important Sabbath, it's a great Sabbath. Okay, So that's when the weekly and the ceremonial Sabbath fall on the same day. It's coming. So let's make sure that we follow the commandment. Let's get them down from the cross so that we can go home and celebrate Te Deum Laudamus. Sing, we are your own people. We keep all that you commanded us. Do you see what happens when people distinguish the day or the form from the meaning? And as Graham would say, they go home and they just crucify the creator of the world, but they are convinced that they are on God's side because they keep the right day. And the Gospels warned us that you can't separate the form and the content, the day and the meaning. So if the final conflict is regarding worship, what does it teach us? Now, if you look into your notes, number seven, Saban has been seen throughout the centuries as a sign of God's authority. Why do we keep the Sabbath? The classical answer is there is no reason for it except for God said so. When you wake up in the morning, if you don't have your smart watch or phone, you would not know which day it is. The rain that falls on Sabbath is not bringing more harvest than the rain that falls on Sunday or Tuesday. The sun shines exactly the same, although I still remember as a little boy, I always felt that the sun was shining better on Sabbath because I couldn't play outside. The only reason why you keep the Sabbath is because God said so. It's a sign of God's authority. And if God as the ultimate authority said so, your response is obedience to authority. Now, it's good as far as it goes, but if you look at the larger context, if you look at the storyline, you can see that the Bible presents the Sabbath as a commitment. After creating the material world in six days, God creates a cathedral in time as a sign of commitment to his creation. Adam and Eve do not keep the first Sabbath because God commanded, but because God came to see them. The sunset Friday night, God says to Adam and Eve, the perfect environment cannot make you happy. The Garden of Eden, the paradise, is not going to make you happy. Have you been to Niagara Falls? Have you seen how many people come to enter the marriage there? Because they believe if that's where you say your I do, your love will be as strong as the waters of Niagara. 
only to discover that if you are not committed to the relationship, if you don't keep working on the relationship, Niagara waters can't help you. It will be the statistics in due time. Environment cannot make you happy. Remember when Adam sees Eve? The prose changes into poetry. If you have a good translation of the Bible, you can see it. This is the bone of my bones. This is the solution of all my dreams and woes. If only you find a slim wife or a Christian husband, everything will work happily ever after. And God says to Adam, Eve cannot make you happy. Adam cannot make you happy. You have been created for a relationship with me. So let's spend the next 24 hours in a mutual relationship. And the first full day for Adam is the day of relationship with God. It's a commitment. It's an expression of God's commitment. If you look at Isaiah 56, and even for those Gentiles, even for those eunuchs, here is my commitment. You are part of God's chosen people. Does it make any difference if you see the Sabbath as a command that you have to keep because of the authority of the one who commanded it? Or if you see it as a commitment on God's part? And your response is a response of receiving the love for commitment. Iris. I just thought it's very intriguing how you summarize Tonstadt's theology. <laughs> I think he made that point very strongly because we have always emphasized the commandment part. And it's just beautiful how you unpacked the relationship and the commitment part where God is at the center of the Sabbath and not an obedience issue. And it's one of the most thought-provoking books that Adventists have written in the last 50 years. Because traditionally we have always emphasized we need to keep the Sabbath because it's part of the Ten Commandments. But in his book, Sigve Tonstadt shows, we have much better argument if we anchor the Sabbath not in the commandment, but in the creation. And because it was given for the first man, it's true also for the last and all in between. While if you anchor it in the commandments, the classical evangelical defense is those are only for the Israel nation. And if you look under number 10, classical Christianity traditionally argues that Sabbath is changeable because it's arbitrary. Most Sabbath keepers agree that it's arbitrary, but they say it's not changeable. And there are some arguments why Jesus didn't change it, the apostles didn't change it. But if you read from Sabbath to the Lord's Day by Don Carson and evangelical groups, they are not that impressed. Now, if the question in the great controversy is that God is arbitrary, are you helping yourself by arguing the Sabbath is arbitrary? If you go with this line of reasoning, you may win the battle for Sabbath, but you lose the battle about the character of God. And you end up with a skewed understanding of the third angel's message, saying, I keep the Sabbath, I'm okay. And that brings you back to John 19:31. When the Jews say, isn't that marvelous that he died before sunset? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Because now we can go home, start the Sabbath on time, and sing, we are your people. We Israelites know you, to quote Hosea. And you and I know they were not God's people. They were not on his side. Because it's not the outward form that God is after. It's the inner meaning that the Sabbath represents about the character of God. Uh, exegetically, we struggle big time when we argue that the Sabbath is the seal, because you can use text from the New Testament about the seal that point in other directions than just a day. But if it's the truth about who God is and how he works, as we have seen, then it takes a profound meaning, because it's ultimately about who you worship. And who you worship determines who you become. Can you see the value in the third Angel's message, God is going to do whatever he takes. In the past, in history, when God raised his voice, when God used the plagues of Egypt, he got people who responded, because that was the language they understood. So at the end of ages, God is going to use whatever it takes to warn people, I don't want you to end up in the wrong crowd. But it's not about the day, it's about the character. Henry? And I think that sometimes we miss it from the Ten Commandments. Because there is a commandment for freedom. You shall keep the Sabbath, but don't do any work. Nobody can force you. Not even me, I'm forcing you. Don't do any work. And it's not just for the Israelites. Not even your servant. Not even your beast. So nobody. This is a commandment of freedom for everybody. 
and that reflects as well the character of God, which is this specific point that makes the seal effective. Those that were paying attention to the minutia face God and call him a demon possessed. And God is not the celestial version of Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, you have too much free time. Your mind is wandering in the wrong direction. We are going to increase the quota. Now we are not going to provide the straw. And he turns the screws and God says, take a day off. I am not Pharaoh. The meaning of your life is not production. The meaning of your life is in relationship. You are not what you produce. I have a colleague in the office who sometimes, when we are the last two in the whole building and leave at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m., the office, he says to me, okay, and you can take the rest of the day off, just as a joke. He's an American, so he has a good sense of humor. And God, in the commandment, shows I am not a pharaoh. Six weeks after Exodus, the salvation act of the Old Testament, he gathers them all on the Sinai and says, you are under a different power now. You are free. No more slavery. Fast forward, they are going to take the commandment and turn it into another slavery. And Jesus comes and says, I don't care about your commandments that you connected with the Sabbath day to turn it into another slavery. I am going to do what I am going to do. Because you completely misunderstood. You forgot to ask the question, why? You need to love your God with all your heart, with all your mind. And if you don't involve the mind, all your strength is going to end up in legalism and fundamentalism, not in the service that God approves. And that's the meaning of the third angel's message. Iris? So, there's so much beauty in this message. It is such a life-giving message. How can we communicate it? If that is the message that the world needs, and we all know the answer is not legalism. How can we truly represent the message of the Sabbath as the good message about a wonderful God who stays committed to us? No matter what. Who doesn't walk off. Who is willing, and I think here's the relevance of Revelation, no matter how bad things get, no matter how dark it gets, he's going to stay with us. It's going to sustain us. How can we find a voice, words that connect with the reality of the fears of people? All of that is very present right now. It is those who don't seem to know God that are very concerned about the survival of the planet. In some ways, I think we need the Holy Spirit in a new way for this message to not only be something that blesses us, but as something that we can communicate. I think of our institutions. I think of Adventist education, Adventist healthcare. How can we use this beautiful treasure that has been entrusted into our hands to communicate that message as a life-giving message to the world? It is the last invite. And I feel like just doing what we've always done is not enough. Because there's a way to preach that it turns people into enemies of God, into legalism, narrow-minded fundamentalism. And God says, if you continue in this direction, you end up fighting the Lamb. You end up where you don't want to be. And because you are created beings, you cannot win that fight. You are going to lose it. And I hate to see that. I don't want you to be in that crowd. Yeah, that's the question. And of course, the 13th lesson will be dealing with that. Livius? I was just looking up the word here for commandments. In verse 12, and the Greek for the word commandment is entole. And it says here, I'm going to pick the definition that is outside the New Testament, how this word is used outside the New Testament. And it says, the meaning is command, commission, A, as a command of a king or official. So what kind of commands do kings and officials dish out? And then B, as the instruction of a teacher. So I wonder if we kind of tend to concentrate on whenever we see commandments, we concentrate on the 10 and then we hone in on number four. But what about being merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness? keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin? Do we do that for our neighbor? 
Is that part of instructions that we've received from a teacher? And remember the context of that in Exodus 33 and 34, 6 and 7. So when Israelites are unfaithful, Moses goes up the mountain and he receives this revelation of God's character. So how is God going to treat us now when we have openly rebelled against him by saying, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt? And God says, I'm going to keep love for 1,000 generations in spite of your behavior. God is committed to accomplish his goals, to bring the story to a glorious conclusion. And once you understand the storyline and how it develops, you can see the meaningfulness of the third angel's message and all three of them, that it's eternal gospel. How do we preach the third angel's message as an eternal gospel? Not as a condemnation of someone who is different than us or a way of putting people down, but as a commitment on God's side to eternal love and to completing the story for anyone who wants to be on his side. Any suggestions? Yes, Iris. I can only share from my experience, from my passion for Adventist higher education. For an educator, there are certain situations that are very challenging. One of them is when people use shortcuts in academic writing. And there are nowadays tools, of course, to detect that. Not only the temptations are stronger, but the tools are more effective with artificial intelligence. Yeah. But the question that's then very real is, okay, so what do you do then? Okay, you know, you have an offense and there is really no beating around the bush. And there are emotions attached to it. Is she or does he think I'm that stupid? Wow. And then there's a certain score called similarity score. And when it's really blatant, I mean, (laughs) you have to really hold on a little bit. But then comes the real situation. I had that this week. And I felt very strongly a need to surrender my own humanness before having a conversation. And then in the conversation, I felt that God was really asking me to listen, to really listen. And I did. And God gave me compassion for a human being here, trying to cope with life, with the demands of life. My students are working professionals with various commitments. And we chose to use a redemptive approach. And we ended with a prayer. And my hope is that this kind of a surprising... Okay, let me also say, what would have been the alternative? The alternative is that there's an academic integrity policy in the syllabus, and it states if you do this, then that will happen. And that would be justice, (laughs) you know, and it is clear. But what would I have achieved? So this is where I think then the way... I hope my student experienced us as professors coming alongside will be a turning point and will change the way someone grows and moves forward in the future. And because that is maybe not what would have happened in another institution, I hope that it also is an approach that speaks well of God. It's not weakness. It's going the extra mile. And... Yeah, that is maybe a feeble attempt to say, okay, this is where it can show up in my life. Yeah, thank you. Nice experience. So you have an option to coldly apply the policy, the rule, and you have the option to model mercy and help the person to understand that this type of behavior is not going to bring them the expected achievement. A student said to me once, but if Matthew Henry said it so well, I could not improve on that. I said, yeah, but then we will give the degree to Matthew Henry, not to you. It may bring the desired outcome, it may not. And even if it does not, it's still important that you act it on your understanding of God's character. And of course, if it doesn't, there is a time to apply the academic honesty policy and to help people face the consequences. Because God says, if no language helps you, the consequences are going to find you out. Ultimately, you can't cheat your way into heaven. Ideas have consequences. Actions have consequences. And that's what the third angel's message is all about. Henry. Oftentimes, we have a tendency to present these messages from we the saved to them the lost. And that's when the denouncing comes. Then is when we present ourselves as better than others. 
and that's not attractive. Presenting this message when I am an equal with everybody else, not feeling superior, but saying this is a call not for you. This is a call for me. This is a call for everybody. Will, I think, give some opportunity to be heard because now I am not preaching. I am saying I am in the same boat like you and we both can enjoy this offer that the loving Father is having for us. So as I said in number 12, we are dealing with the future unfulfilled prophecy. Jesus says twice in John 13 and 14, I am telling you now so that when it happens, then you will know. So if you are dealing with an unfulfilled prophecy and you know, you say, I know today what, how it's going to happen that borders on blasphemy. Because Jesus says the purpose of the prophecy is so that you know when it happens, not before. We have possible scenarios. We can imagine, or we can't, how it could go. But the purpose is not to say, I am right, you are wrong, and I love to tell you that. The purpose is to show that it's about God's character of love, undeserved grace, and eternal commitment to his created children, and we are all in the same boat. And when God's character is presented like that, some people will respond, who would never respond, let me tell you, I am right, you are wrong. And it brings me great joy to drive it in. Because then it's something else that is motivating what I do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, these words have been so misunderstood throughout the centuries and caused untold anguish and suffering to many people. And forgive us when we have contributed to that. Help us to see them as an expression of your love and care for your created beings and present them in such a way that your character of love, your undeserved grace and eternal commitment to each one of us can shine through and people who don't know you yet can see you in a new light so that the knowledge of your character covers the world as the waters cover the sea. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.